Good evening, everybody. It's great that you're joining me again this evening. Thank you so much. So today, we are traveling to southern France, the Midi, Occitania, or as the medieval Jews called it, Provence. This refers to a somewhat ill-defined region that in the Middle Ages comprised not only Provence proper, but also Languedoc, Roussillon, and Comte Venaison. Because this entire territory, from Roussillon in the west to Provence in the east, was only loosely organized and full of political divisions, especially in the 12th, 13th centuries when we are particularly studying it, it had no single name in any language. Even at the dawn of the 14th century, one prominent Jewish scholar refers to his home for a lack of name of it, the land of 10 days walk from Perpignan, Roussillon to Marseille, Provence. And we have to keep on reminding ourselves that this southern side of France had little to do with the north. Royal France, as in northern France, had no portion of this region in the 12th century. Hence, reference to this region as southern France, or the south of France, or the Midi, constitutes an anachronistic distortion in our context. Needless to say, reference to our region as Provence is also rather a misidentification. The area under consideration may be designated as Provence only if understood that we are covering the widest territorial limits to which this term is applied. Some of the major centers that we will be talking about today are listed here. I won't go through the list, but you can see it on your screen. And here you have Béziers, the wine capital of Languedoc, with its Jewish quarter. Known as Le Petit Jérusalem during the Middle Ages, Béziers was a center of Jewish learning and the home to many Jewish scholars, poets, and liturgists. And I want us to study Provence during its richest and most fecund period. The Jews here constituted a larger, wealthier, more powerful, and more vocal community than their northern brethren. Whereas in northern France, Jews were continually isolated and degraded under the kings of France. Remember, they are the most powerful kings in the West and the kings who further advanced towards absolutism. In the South, no noble family ever ruled over the Jews with this single-mindedness. And a, as a consequence, the Jews in the South avoided some of the pressures of northern life. And I will show you how its center for widespread Jewish learning places Provence second only to Spain that we studied last week. Provence's geographical location also made it the meeting point for the scientific culture developed under Arabic influence in Spain and also the Talmudic learning of the French Jews. And together, we are going to witness relatively favorable social, political, and economic circumstances in Provence, the confrontation of conventional cultural preoccupations with new secular learning, the interactive interaction of Jewish and Christian cultural developments, and polemics and fascinating personality clashes between rabbinic figures. So let's start at the beginning. When and how was this Jewish community established? Well, there is some suggestion that Jews had lived here since the period of Roman domination, and they had never lost the semblance of protection under Roman law. The area of Languedoc-Roussillon, in particular, was home to Jewish communities dating back to the Roman and Carolingian times, including the famous academic center in Narbonne. Here we have documents and traditions, but no literary remnants of, of certain individual Provencal scholars or scholarly monuments. The Jewish presence in Narbonne 
seems to date from at least the 5th century, as confirmed by letters written in 470 and 473. In the 7th century, stones found with inscriptions in Hebrew and Latin attest to the Jews' presence. And it seems to have been a period of oral study, appropriation, and dissemination. There were also smaller centers in Bézières, as I've already mentioned, in Carcassonne, as you see here, in Lunel, in Montpellier, and even in Arles. And in 1165, the traveler Benjamin of Tudela estimated that the size of the Jewish community in Arles was about 200 families. When he visited Lunel in 1166, he described it as a town of about 300 Jews, a city of scholars who studied day and night, and that students from other communities who came here were provided with shelter, food, and clothes. It was one of the oldest communities in France, a center of scholarship, as important as the community of Narbonne. And according to Benjamin as well, about 300 families also lived in the Episcopal See of Marseille, which he described as a city of the, quote, Geonim and the wise. How do we know where Jews lived in these places? Well, usually from the concentration of Jewish settlement in a street or in a quarter, Jusataria, Cadera, Judaica, which began as a sort of spontaneous development inspired by the demands of practicing the faith as well as by the closeness, which is the sign of every minority. And even if the negligible number of Jews in the rather small localities did not justify a concentration in their own street, as you see here in Toulon, the synagogue the communal buildings, the synagogue, the slaughterhouse, where the so-called meat of the law was sold, the ritual, the ritual bath or mikveh, as we have still extant in Montpellier, but also a baking house, especially for the unleavened, Passover bread or matzah, and the charitable institutions, hospices, poor houses, etc., often all conveniently housed in one building, a kind of community center. Only the Jewish cemetery was naturally located outside the walls of the city. But for us, the curtain of Jewish history really rises in the mid 12th century, when contact with the Spanish Andalusian South began to increase, and this contact grew more intense with the arrival into the Southern French academies of Spanish Jewish intellectuals who had fled the Almohad invasion we talked about last week. Jews now come from Spain, Portugal, and even Italy, settling in places like Paysana that you see here, and working in the trade of clothes, cattle, and the sale of wool and sheets. And here in the, suite, in the street of the Juiveni, an earthen tank, as I write here, formed a small basin in the, uh, in the basement of a house that could have been a mikveh has been found. There was additional cultural influence arriving in southern France in the second half of the 12th century. This was the Talmudic methodology of Rashi's grandsons, Shmuel ben Meir, the Rashbam, and Yaakov ben Meir, the Rabbeinu Tam, move southwards from northern, northern France during their lifetime. And this influx of Jews continues into Provence in the 13th century, making it more vibrant. Around 1300, Provence receives even more exiled Jews fleeing from northern uh, Europe. The expulsion decreed across the English Channel in 1290 drove some English Jews to seek refuge in Provence in Manosque and in Relon, in the center of the map, as you can see. And the archive documents Jews with names such as Moses Anglicus or Simon de Crilade for Cricklade, which is a town in Wiltshire 
in England. By chance, a census conducted by King Robert is preserved for 1341, which placed the Jewish inhabitants in the capital city of Aix-en-Provence alone at 1,205 persons, women and children included, in 203 households, which is an average of 5.9 uh, persons per household. Thus, the entire number of Jewish families in the Aix district ran to about 250. And as you see, the present-day Rue de Verrierie corresponds to part of the old Jewish quarter of Aix-en-Provence. Here were the synagogue, the butcher shop, the hospital, and the almshouse. None of these buildings, unfortunately, remain. And it's only by the early 14th century that we can say with confidence that the proportion of Jews to Christians is about 3%, three Jews to 100 Christians. And other cities and towns on the border of Languedoc offer us Jewish populations of 10%, 15%, 28%, and even 30% of total residents. And what is amazing about our Provencal Jewish history is that here we witness many dynamic features of Jewish life. It is a case study for the analysis of the rise and fall of Jewish culture in a foreign environment. Its cultural productivity is sufficiently impressive and comprehensive so as to present a colorful microcosm of medieval Jewish intellectual history. These are our wise Jews. Another aspect here is the relative weakness of the church, the relative looseness of diocesan organization in the south, and the disharmony between native political leaders and high churchmen. These independent areas were left relatively free for Jews to participate unencumbered in the thriving Mediterranean economy. But having said that, let's take a quick look at the rulers in Provence. Beside the stubborn independence of powerful suzanities and ancient municipalities in the south, French kings will eventually impose themselves occasionally in the south, and we need to be aware of them. In the 1240s, King Louis of France had extended his rule over Languedoc. This move really strangles the Jews. For example, in 1246, the king strongly attacked Jewish money lending in the south. The king orders that the Jews were to cease being money lenders and, quote, exacting usury, unquote, as it was called, turning instead to other means of earning their livelihood. Another powerful Christian leader in the south at this time was the Archbishop of Narbonne. He was the possessor of substantial temporal holdings and wealth, including a large and vigorous jury, and was also the highest ranking prelate in Languedoc. If the Jewish sources are to be believed, the archbishops of the 1240s to the 1260s, Guillaume de Boulle and Guy Fulcodi, showed themselves consistently friendly and sympathetic to our Jews. And what we see here is Provencal Jews being represented by capable and combative spokesmen appealing on a number of occasions to these archbishops directly for their own privileges. So on the one hand, we have a northern French king interfering when he has the power to do so, and on the other, an archbishop who shows himself to be more favorable. A different ruler again was that of the city of Papignon. Even though geographically it was in Provence, it was under Majorcan sovereignty, since the king of Majorca was a vassal 
to the king of Aragon. And Papignon was technically Aragonese. We also have dukes in Provence. For example, the Duke of Anjou, who held certain Provencal domains. And in 1306, Charles of Anjou, or his son Robert, who may just then have come to power, accepted Jews fleeing from the Kingdom of France. And we also have to bring into the picture the sacerdotal and imperial vicissitudes of the papacy, which actually comes to reside in Provence in the 14th century. This will be a little bit too late for our story, but an important ending, perhaps. Comtat Venison. Due to a schism of rival popes who were competing for recognition, popes came to Avignon to live between 1309 and 1376 for 67 years. This was followed by the schism when rival popes competed for recognition as the supreme pontiff. And this situation was not resolved until 1417, when Martin V was elected as the Pope and established his papal court back in Rome. This territory is owned by the popes until 1791. In these images, you see the Palais des Papes. Now, the Jews living in the Comtat Venison lived in the first Jewish quarter, the, or the Carrière, and this quarter in Avignon actually faced the Pope's palace on Rue de la Vieille in the Juiverie. By the early century, 13th century, the Carrière was on, on Rue Jacob and Place Jerusalem, where the present day synagogue stands. And this tiny area, barely 100 square yards, was home to over 1,000 Jews. So the popes who lived here were Frenchmen, and their presence in Avignon helped turn a town of middling importance to a place that was geographically central to Christendom. It is interesting, as I would argue, that here we see popes much less interested in the Jews than the popes of Rome. They applied the church policy weakly and spasmodically, interfering as little as possible with any local situation, except that is for one pope, and this is Pope John the 22nd, Pope from 1316 to 1334, who expelled the Jews from the Comtat in 1322. They did return in 1345 after his death. To discuss the history of the Jews in the Comtat demands another lecture. Let me just say that in general the popes defended their own Jews of the county Venison and of Avignon because these Jews worked hard to make the popes comfortable. The popes allow these Jews to be moneylenders and had very little to say about it. Jews here were merchants, artisans, providing the papal court with articles of the better and more unusual kind which other merchants did not handle, such as tablecloths, fish, horses, prayer books, tailoring, makers of parchment, and even book bindings. And the Jews are only allowed to settle here in four of the cities. Avignon that I've mentioned, Carpentras here that you see, and its synagogue, which is actually established in the 14th century. And here I list the four towns where Jews can, se can settle, Avignon, Carpentras, lille sur la sorgue and Caveillon. And here you see Caveon, its synagogue was also really established in the 14th century, and of course, l'île sur le soc. The Jews are not allowed to live in the villages, but only in these four towns. And look at l'île sur le soc. Here is the Jewish quarter, 
And Jews continue to emigrate to this part of Provence and last here until the French Revolution. So let's go a little bit deeper into our Provencal Jewish life. What we have to appreciate is the strength of the Jewish community here. And in this, it can be compared to Spain. The sheer fact of a huge Jewish population with its own strong self of itself as a lobbying entity could confront moral, social and political reformers. Thousands of Jews are living in the South in the teeming maritime cities and towns and in the hinterlands of these commercial centers. Our Jews of Provence are confident Jews. I think, I think it is a sense of confidence perpetuated by a highly elaborate and mannered literary culture of Jewish thinkers. We will witness the relative openness of the society the grassroot contacts between Jews and Christians, the ease of social intercourse, and the cultural liaison entered into by Jewish and Christian intellectuals. But we look, before we look at this cultural prosperity, let's say something about the Jews' profession. We know that the Jews were artisans, moneylenders, merchants, and physicians. As artisans, they were tailors, shoemakers, producers of paper and parchment, as I said already, in Comtat Venissant. They also um, delved in coral objects and even made soap. And as merchants, as I write here, they delved into livestock, breeding, textiles and food commodities. We've spoken already about Jews being moneylenders, particularly when we were looking at the Jews of medieval England. So let's turn to their doctoring, to their being physicians, which I would argue is more fascinating. It is very easy to find the title of a Jewish physician in notorial documents of the Midi. The title, Medicus Physicus, or surgeon, Medicus Surgicus is registered without exception by notaries, making them easily recognized. Towns had numerous Jewish physicians, but there is no evidence that Jews had a part in founding or organizing the School of Medicine in Montpellier, as you might well read on the internet. Jews are barred from universities at this time. Jewish Physicians definitely benefited by studying privately in groups or alone. And Jews who successfully passed an oral exam among themselves were licensed to practice. So usually physicians were trained within the families where a father would pass on to his knowledge to his son or a father-in-law to his son-in-law and they transmitted their theoretical knowledge by means of manuscripts whose circulation is well documented in the archives. And we must stress here the endogamy to be observed among the physicians, that is the desire to marry with other physician families or into other wealthy families, for example, those of financiers. In Marseille, the Jewish physicians outnumbered the Christian ones and enjoyed favor in the city because of the frequent epidemics that threatened it. But these were physicians not only serving Jews. Despite admonitions to the contrary by the church, Jews served as doctors and were called upon by all levels of society, by simple folk, by respected folk, by nuns, by monks and important church dignitaries, and even by the rulers of Provence. And at the same time, these physicians were leading personalities in the community, chosen to represent it as bailon, that means authorized agents or advisors, and in this function, to apportion and collect the Italia Eudorum, the Jewish tax, 
to decide conflicts and to officiate as the community's trusted smoke spokesman vis-à-vis -vis the majority society. And so we see Spanish Jewish physicians contributing to the development of medicine in southern France, transmitting the medical knowledge that they bring with them from Spain, and being purveyors of medical ways of thinking about health and infirmity. There can be no doubt that there was a lively interchange between Jewish physicians in Spain and those in southern France. So this is when the fun starts. We are in the midst of a period of remarkable demographic, economic and cultural prosperity. I want you to imagine the dynamic learning in Provence of Talmudic, of Talmudic literature and midrash, as well as innovation in halachic ideas, methods, and literary genres. Something important happens at the end of the 12th century. Many Spanish Jews pour into Provence, and they have a different type of knowledge unknown in this region before, and it comes in particularly from the studies of the Rambam. Until this moment, the Jews in these Christian domains had a long tradition of rabbinic scholarship in Hebrew, but no knowledge of Arabic texts that had now been translated into Hebrew. Refugees from Muslim Spain were bringing with them a cultural heritage of high status and rousing their curiosity. The arrival into Narbonne and Lunel of Judah ibn Tivon and Joseph ben Yitzchak Kimchi, emigres from the Almohad invasion of Spain, bringing with them secular learning and Arabic scholarship establishing foundations of their family dynasties in Provence. Joseph ben Kimchi was a grammarian, exegete, poet, and translator. Judah ibn Tivon that you see here resided in Lunel, where he was not only physician, but also merchant, translator, and bibliophile. Five members of the Ibn Tivon family spanning four generations from approximately 1160 to 1306 produced over 70 Hebrew translations of Judeo Arabic, Greco Arabic, Arabic, and other Latin writings. I want you to think of these translators not as antiquarian or ivory tower scholars suspended far above the city, but instead were actively involved in the affairs of the city, eagerly devoted to rousing their contemporaries and stimulating change. They consciously saw themselves as reformers and enlighteners. Whereas in Spain, secular culture among Jews, as we saw last time, had been part of this worldview in harmony with that of the surrounding Arab society, and was thought to prepare members of the community for their careers in the civil service. In France, this devotion to secular culture was new and would have to be justified. Provincial Jews begin to get worked up about this type of knowledge. And let's think for a moment what are the intellectual camps looking like in Provence at this time? Well, inside the Jewish community, there are three main intellectual camps. We have, as you can see here, traditional Ashkenazi rabbis whose main interest was in questions of halakha and Talmudic exegesis, right? We're in France, this is not surprising. These are the Ashkenazi Jews. Then we have the Kabbalists, and whose, their main concern was that of theosophical speculation. These were Kabbalists who at first haltingly and then reservedly, then boldly and more confidently moved mystical speculation and experience to the center of the stage. And some of the oldest known Kabbalistic texts 
were redacted or first circulated here in Provence. And the earliest devotees of the new doctrines organized themselves um, in Provence at this time. But we also have this new philosophical group whose major intellectual interests are going to be secular in nature. And I want you to imagine this feverish intellectual activity among the Jews of late 13th century Provence, particularly in science and philosophy, for example, in Bézières that we've already spoken about. Is it surprising that in a space of relative peace in the medieval period, which is really quite unique, a bitter controversy would erupt between Jewish promoters of Greek science and the more traditionalist rabbis who worried about the damage that philosophical study might on inflict on young minds. This chapter in Provence is known as the Maimonist controversy, so-called, of course, because of Maimonides' writing featuring central to this debate. But of course, it was neither the first nor the last curricular battle of its sort to royal Jewish communities. But it is fascinating, and I want to share it with you because in many ways, I feel it must define our appreciation of Jewish intellectual life in medieval Provence. So I've already hinted that the Rambam's works are behind the controversy. Let's take a deeper look at them and remind ourselves about him. We have seen him in other contexts, the cultured Jews of Spain last week and the Cairo Geniza. Obviously, he was never in Provence, but his presence was felt especially through his works and what they meant to the Jewish communities there. I'm sure I don't need to remind such an educated crowd as you that Moses Maimonides is by far one of the two most famous Jews, medieval Jews, of the time. The other one, of course, is Rashi. Just briefly, let me go over Rambam's name or names. His Hebrew name was Moshe ben Maimon. His father, Maimon, was also a Jewish scholar of some merit, although outshined, of course, by his brilliant son. Ides, Maimonides. Ides is this Greek suffix that means son of, like ben in Hebrew. I don't know who had the idea of giving him a Greek, Greek suffix ending, like Nachmonides. It seems sort of silly to me, but frankly, at this late date, I think it's really hard to do anything about it. And Maimonides, he remains in the academic world, but not in the Jewish world. There he is usually the Rambam, standing for Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. He was born either in 1135 or in 1138. He says one thing, his grandson says another. He was born in Cordova in Spain, as we've talked about last week. He died in 1204 in Egypt, and he is buried in Tiberias next to the Sea of Galilee. Maimonides is famous mainly for the three most important texts that he wrote. He is famous as the author of the 13 principles of faith, of the law, call, uh, the law code called the Mishnah Torah, and, a, and of a work of medieval philosophy called the More Nevuchim, the guide for the perplexed. For our understanding of Provence, we need to look at his second and third works. Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, which he wrote in his 30s, is of course a law code, which is beautifully ordered for the most part. It is lucidly clear Maimonides on his worst day, I think, is much clearer than almost any other medieval Jewish writer. The Mishnah Torah includes absolutely every topic in Jewish law, including all 613 biblical commandments and everything else. 
It even has this little section on how to write a Sefer Torah, which is really missing in the Talmud. And it very rarely offers more than one way of doing anything. In that respect, of course, it is the opposite of the Talmud. Just what the doctor ordered, excuse the pun. People immediately complained. It is difficult to find a topic in the Talmud, so it is often quite hard to know what Maimonides is, where Maimonides is getting his laws from. He doesn't tell us. Not all of them are in the Talmud, as we said. There was then, so as there is now, some suspicion that he even made some of them up. Furthermore, other rabbis in his time disagreed with Maimonides on some things, as we will see. One particular rabbi in Provence, Rabbi Abraham ben David of Posquier, represented the strict rabbinic party, openly criticized the Rambam. And the fact that nothing worse resulted from the agitation during the Rambam's life shows, I think, that the forces of cohesion and solidarity were stronger than those which might have torn Judaism apart. But it was not just his Mishnah Torah. His more, Nevuchim, was even more problematic for our Jews of Provence. The more Nevuchim, the guide for the perplexed, focused on beliefs that were important to medieval Jews in their polemics with Christians and Muslims, such as the principle that God has no body, that God will never replace the Torah with another law, and that the Messiah, the Moshiach, will come in the future. His philosophy in this work, though, was anything but conservative, at least in a Jewish context. And when he turned to the Bible, sorry, when he turned to philosophy, he looked at the Bible with Aristotle. And he is convinced that Aristotle began just with what he could see. More than any other Jewish thinker, Rambam himself becomes infatuated with Aristotle's philosophy, convinced that Judaism, although based on truths revealed by God to Moses, need not oppose philosophy. For Maimonides, philosophy is not just logic. Philosophy includes the sciences, includes astronomy, includes medicine. Aristotle has a metaphysics. He has a theory of language and literature. He has a theory of politics and law. Aristotle's theory of politics and law helps Maimonides define what Jewish law is. Similarly, Aristotle's astronomy helps Maimonides think about the calendar. His medical theories help Maimonides think about Jewish diet. His theory of language helps Maimonides think about the Bible and its language. And his metaphysics, this was the most controversial part, helps Maimonides think about God. I don't think I'm capable of summarizing Maimonides' philosophy, and I don't think it's wise to try. Let me just say the pious medieval monotheists in Provence were apt to rely on religious rituals, but philosophers such as Maimonides tried to encourage them not to. Praying for the sick is a mitzvah. It is praiseworthy, but it is not medicine. Maimonides' God does not work by magic. To a large extent, and maybe strictly, he does not work by miracle either. He works by nature, at least for the most part, and perhaps strictly and without exception. Jews should focus on nature and on understanding nature and living their lives in conformance with nature so as to achieve good results through nature. Again, medicine is a crucial model. And so we have a slightly complicated picture of someone who fueled an intense and impatient drive to educate and guide the Jewish people. 
If we think about it geographically as well, this flowering of literary and cultural activity can be traced at least partly to contemporary economic and political circumstances that allowed for relative peaceful existence in Provence, as I noted earlier. Not only did these Spanish Jews seek to teach philosophy, they aimed to make Judaism philosophical, like the Rambam. Legal works now began to be prefaced with philosophical discussion of law. Biblical books and rabbinic legends were explained in light of Aristotelian principles of science and classical rabbinic literary forms were revived and adapted to the new purpose of teaching philosophy. But of course, there were also critics and cynics. The first to be criticized in Provence was the Mishnah Torah. And we have a list of Provencal rabbis who became involved. Rabbi Abraham ben David that I have just already mentioned, but here our list shows us Rabbi Yonatan ben David HaKohen of Lunel. He defended Rambam against the severe attacks of Abraham David, David of Posquier, and at Jonathan's instance, Maimonides sent to Lunel his Moren of Uchim, which Samuel ibn Tibon had translated into Hebrew. Rabbi Mushulan ben Moses and Rabbi Cheskia ben Manoach, both of them were very critical of the Rambam's work. But it's at this point that I think we need to span out and think about really what else is happening in the 13th century. Why do our Provencal Jews make such a fuss? What are they really worried about? Well, historians have generally agreed that the 13th century was the most eventful period in the Middle Ages. It was the apex of medieval intellectualism, a cultural revolution, and it saw radical changes in the civil, social, and ecclesiastical organizations of European lands. And perhaps for most, most importantly for us, Aristotle is getting noticed by Christians as well as Jews. And let us look at some of these 13th century events that made Jews nervous. Well, first of all, the capture of Constantinople by the Crusaders in 1204, the year of Maimonides' death. Now, this really wasn't supposed to happen. They were supposed to be on their way to Jerusalem, but they end up turning on Constantinople uh, 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 instead. And this brings before the world the full and original works of Aristotle for the first time. Constantinople had been the storehouse of classical learning in the, middle, in the early Middle Ages. Up to Maimonides' day, scholars had had to depend on the Arabic version of only a small part of Aristotle's writing. The Muslims had translated um, the Greek into Arabic. But now Constantinople is open. Its works become much more available. The circulation of Aristotle's works that could be translated now from Greek into Latin meant that learning, intellectualism, can take a step forward. The large universities, among them Montpellier and Paris, fought for the right of education with the monasteries and gradually superseded them. But then something happens to counter this. The church, the papacy, gets nervous. It is now that Christianity decides to react against Greek philosophy. An interdict issued by a synod in Paris in 1210 against the public or private reading of the books of Aristotle on natural philosophy, as well as commentaries on them. Pope Gregory IX renews the ban 
against the use of Aristotle's writing in the University of Paris in 1231, until he said, quote, that they shall have been examined and purged of all heresy, unquote. Let's just remember that Montpellier is this stronghold of Christian orthodoxy at this time, as both Dominicans and Franciscans maintained theological schools there. And despite papal rulings here, ancient learning and rational philosophy, especially that of Aristotle, is cultivated at the expense of reverence for the canonical literature. And in 1231, the Pope began a permanent inquisition, the creation of the medieval inquisition against heretics, ordering them to be delivered to the secular arm for execution when condemned to death. In all of the cities in southern France, courts of heresy were instituted under the control of Dominicans and Franciscans. Note that these two mendicant orders dedica dedicated themselves anyway to preaching and teaching, even turning theological arguments into social prejudice against the Jews. The Jews are nervous. This is also the time of the Albigensian heresy that really erupts in Provence. And it's interesting that their own rejection of hell and denial of resurrection was similar to Rambam. So as I said before, with all of these huge changes that are going on in the 13th century, our Jews of Provence suddenly get nervous. Should they be showing this type of interest in Aristotle? It is a time of wider religious controversies when the Christian world is becoming a persecutor of those who do not fit into society. The Jews of Provence are suddenly concerned that Maimonides has gone too far. Provencal Jews want to believe that the, that the Torah itself contains all the knowledge necessary for mankind and that the Rambam's use of Aristotle to explore into the learnings of other people and other languages was this affront to the God of Israel and his renewed law. But having said this, we should remember that even in the heat of the quarrel, the Rambam still sort of retains universal admiration of the people as a legal and religious authority. What was resented was the fact that he laid stress upon philosophy and certain theological ideas. Now, the actual conflict did not occur until a quarter of a century after Maimonides' death. Now the anti-Maimonists form an aggressive party, raise the cry of heresy within the Jewish community, and seeing Maimonides as this potential source of danger, they hand over his works to the Inquisition, which brings about the burning of some of the Rambam's texts. And remember that Christianity, as I've just said, is also struggling with Aristotle's philosophy in their religious texts. But most modern scholars believe that the Rambam's Mishnah Torah was actually burnt in Montpellier in the 1230s. The rabbis argued that these works in the hands of less educated Jews would wreak havoc. Now it's strange because these were exactly the type of people whom Maimonides had said that he had written his Mishnah Torah for. Note what Maimonides had said in the beginning of his Mishnah Torah, in his introduction. I explicitly stated in the beginning of my code that I compiled it only for those who were unqualified to descend into the depths of the Talmud and who would not understand from it the matter of forbidden and permitted things. So I want you to imagine disputes being held mostly in the synagogues and the academies of the learned in Provence, in the yeshivot. Arguments ensued over whether Jews should be permitted to study science and philosophy 
without any restriction. The counter zeal of Provencal Jews for scientific and metaphysical learning was unusual, but needs to be the sort of defining characteristic here of what happens in medieval Provence. And the disputes often became so acute that physical injuries were inflicted upon the combatants. Now, rabbis from Spain try to sort things out. One particular rabbi, the Spanish rabbi, Shmuel ben Abraham ben Avraham Saporta, who in an epistle to the French rabbis, of course, that's the only way of communication. It's a question of wait, waiting for letters to be brought to Provence. In this letter, Saporta condemned as despicable the tactics of the anti maimonists in summoning Christian ecclesiastical authorities to help them and label this exposure of internal communal trouble before the eyes of the world, a desecration of God's name and treason to Israel. His arguing made a lot of sense. He argued that when the Mishnah Torah had first appeared in Provence, the foremost rabbis had praised it. No one dared to open his mouth against it or mutter against the doctrines he formulated. They did not then expound them falsely or pronounce them hateful. Why then do you now, your excellencies, dispute them? Why do you clamor against them? Why not thoroughly investigate before drastic measures are taken? Now all congregations in the north, south, east or west uphold the bond of these precious writings and their reverence for our master Maimonides is like the fear of God. And you sense to what extent supporters are trying to say enough. We have to come together. We have to be mature about this. And they have, he argued, brought excessive attention to Maimonides' work. And what of the future, Rabbi Shmuel ben Abraham supporter argues? He foresaw a time when people will not be able to resist the seductive charms of philosophy and would become alienated from Judaism. After this act, the opposition seems to have fallen away. One protagonist, Rabbi Yonah ben Avraham Gerondi in Girona, deserted the anti maimonists Solomon ben I um, Abraham ibn Adret, a very influential Spanish rabbi as well, and another opponent was even deeply apologetic. And even Ramban, Nachmanides, counseled a compromise from Barcelona. And here, the collapse of the anti maimonist movement came when Jonah, Jonah Girondi, realizing the frightful consequences of the struggle, experienced a change of heart. He retracted and openly came across to confess in the synagogues the following. I am smitten with shame and remorse that I open my mouth against our holy master, Moses ben Maimon, and his writings. I hereby confess wholeheartedly that Moses and his teachings are true, that we are the deceivers. I undertake henceforth to visit and prostrate myself over his grave in the company of 10 persons to visit the grave for seven days and to repeat daily, quote, I have sinned against the God of Israel and against our master, Moses ben Maimon, Moshe ben Maimon, for I have spoken perversely against his books. Even though he makes this vow, he does begin his journey, but he doesn't quite make it to Tiberius. At this point, he goes to Paris. He then comes to Montpellier and then to Barcelona, where he publicly makes the same retraction. But unfortunately, it was not all over. It would rise again in 1290, this time by a mystic, Solomon Petit of northern France. And it is unbelievable how animated this became on its second coming. But we need to define this struggle not merely as anti-Maimonist, but as being anti-philosophic. The conservatives of Provence and Spain now turned against philosophy in general 
and against the rationalist interpretation of the Bible, which had become so popular. And so the ghost of Maimonides is seen stalking about in the ranks of both liberals and conservatives, who have by this time become divided into two hostile camps on the larger question of whether philosophy should be permitted or prescribed. Such outstanding scholars through this whole controversy, such as Solomon bin Ibn Adret, Asher ben Yechiel, Abba Marie ben Moshe, Menachem Meiri, the Ibn Tivon family, Yedidia Bedesi, and at least 100 rabbis of Provence, all leaders in their communities, had taken part in this struggle. It spread over Spain, over Provence and northern France, and ended only with the expulsion of the Jews from royal France in 1306 by order of King Philip IV the Fair. The effort to restrict philosophy was doomed to failure. And this time, the expulsion is going to um, affect our southern Jews in Provence, since Montpellier this time was ruled by James II of Majorca, the uncle of King James II of Aragon. But the Lord of Montpellier was also a vassal of Philip IV of France and ultimately was forced to implement Philip's decree in that city. In October 1306, this rather momentous expulsion quietened the controversy against philosophy and reminded the Jews of Provence, as they saw the Jews, the Jews of Montpellier being expelled, that there were more important matters of survival to be dealt with than philosophy. The Jews were actually allowed to return to Montpellier in 1315. But I hope I have been able to convey the rather heated controversy that occurred in southern France at a peaceful moment in the Middle Ages. It allows us to conclude, perhaps, that had peace existed in more areas for longer periods of time, confrontations between different schools of Jews might well have been more frequent. But what should be underlined is that Maimonides had balanced his rationalism with conformity to the ritual and with unusual judicial activity, thus making himself immune to condemnation by the synagogue or by any court. And then we have the 14th century with its series of external situations. The shepherd's crusade, where Jews were often the target of attack. And then the Black Death of 1348 to 49, took much attention away from philosophical disputes. And then the expulsion of Jews from Provence in 1501, after Provence became united under the kings of France. It resulted in the emigration of around 1,000 Jews from Provence who moved to more distant regions, to the Levant and to the Maghreb, and only some Jewish settlements continue in Comtat Venaissant with the popes and also in Avignon. But I think we can say that we have witnessed, perhaps not surprisingly, that Jews of the medieval period, when they were able, could, with confidence, dispute and argue the role of philosophy in religion openly and vigorously. These were our wise and definitely learned Jews of Provence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. It's always a pleasure traveling to other places, seeing different sites. Um, John has a question. He said, is it not true that many Sephardic Jews moved to Saloniki and integrated with their Romaniot Jewish communities there? We're just thinking about it from a, um, from a later period 
we're looking particularly at this, you know, 13th century. Remember, the Sephardi Jews don't really move in the, in the, the amounts that they move to Saloniki and other places until 1492, which is the end of the 15th century. So our series particularly just concentrates more on the sort of the medieval experience. So we haven't got there yet. Okay. You want to give us a few words hinting to next week? Okay, well, next week we're going to um, look at Portugal, particularly, again, remember that I'm interested in the, the more prosperous periods of Jewish history before the expulsions, before the forced conversion of Jews in Portugal. We'll be having fun at seeing what I call sophisticated Jews, how well they become in some ways similar to what we've seen in Spain, courtier Jews, but really they really delve into their own uh, place in Portugal. They become involved with maritime um, um, sort of uh, looking for new spaces, expansion of, of Portugal, and really do an incredible amount during the medieval period. So I'm very excited to take you there next week.